Kakut stood at attention, his four eyes fixed on the holographic display before him. The central chamber of the Galactic Council buzzed with nervous energy as representatives from a thousand worlds watched the proceedings unfold. At the center of it all stood a lone human, small and fragile looking compared to the towering forms of the council members. You cannot be serious, the human said, a hint of amusement in his voice. You expect us to remain confined to our solar system. I, Counselor Nithi, leaned forward. This is not a request, human. It is a decree. Your species is too volatile, too unpredictable to be allowed unfettered access to the stars. For the safety of all, you will remain within the bounds of your system. Kutz felt a surge of pride. This was why he had joined the Galactic Peacekeeping Force to maintain order and protect the delicate balance of the cosmos from upstart races like these humans. The humans' laughter echoed through the chamber, sending a ripple of unease through the assembled dignitaries. With all due respect, High Counselor, you can take your decree and shove it out an airlock. Humanity will not be caged. Gasps and murmurs filled the air. Kutz's hand instinctively moved to the energy pistol at his hip. Such blatant disrespect was unheard of in these hallowed halls. High Counselor Nati's voice boomed, silencing the chamber. You leave us no choice. If humanity will not abide by our laws, then you will be contained by force. This council hereby declares a state of war against the human race. The human smile never wavered. I was hoping you'd say that with a mocking bow, he turned and strode from the chamber. As the council erupted into chaos, Kutz felt a mixture of excitement and trepidation. War. Against a single species confined to one star system, it would be over in hours. How wrong he was. The next day, as Kutz boarded the massive warship Righteous Fury, reports came flooding in. Human ships had been detected far beyond their system, already engaging council forces on multiple fronts. Impossible. They shouldn't have had the technology, the numbers, or the audacity for such brazen attacks. Standing on the bridge, watching the swirling maps of battle zones spreading across the galaxy, Kutz realized that everything they thought they knew about humans had been wrong. This wouldn't be a simple peacekeeping operation. This was war, and the humans were fighting like they had nothing to lose. As the righteous fury jumped to light speed, heading for the first of many battlefields, Kutz couldn't shake the feeling that they had just made a terrible mistake. The humans should have cowered, should have submitted to the Council's unquestionable authority. Instead, they laughed. And now, the galaxy would burn. The bridge of the Righteous Fury was silent save for the low hum of machinery and the occasional beep of the sensor array. Kutz stood rigid, all four of his eyes fixed on the main viewscreen as the vast human fleet came into view. It had been three standard rotations since the declaration of war, and already the conflict had spread to a dozen star systems. This is impossible, muttered Captain Vexlor, his scale covered hands clenching the command chair. Our intelligence said they had no more than a hundred interstellar capable ships. There are thousands out there. Kutz felt a chill run down his spine. The humans shouldn't have been able to mount a defense like this, let alone launch coordinated attacks across multiple sectors. Something was very wrong. All ships, engage at will Vexlor ordered, his voice tight with tension. Let's remind these primitives why the Galactic Council has stood unopposed for 10,000 years. The space between the fleets lit up with energy weapons and missile trails. Kutz watched in horror as the first wave of Council ships was shredded by unexpectedly accurate human fire. Their weapons were far more advanced than anything the humans should have possessed. Evasive maneuvers Vex Lore shouted as a massive human dreadnought emerged from hyperspace dangerously close to the Righteous Fury. The ship shuddered under the impact of enemy fire, shields flaring. Kutz rushed to a tactical station, assisting the overwhelmed crew. Sir, we're detecting numerous smaller craft launching from the human ships. There, they appear to be single pilot fighters. Impossible Vex lore hissed. No species has used manned fighters in centuries. The neural loads are too great for organic pilots. But the evidence was undeniable. Swarms of agile human fighters darted between the capital ships, their impossible maneuvers suggesting living pilots pushing themselves to the very edge of survival. Hours passed, 
and what should have been a swift victory turned into a grueling battle of attrition. The Council forces found themselves outmaneuvered at every turn, the humans displaying levels of coordination and tactical acumen that defied explanation. As the righteous fury limped away from the battlefield, one of many retreat. In Council vessels, Coot stared at the casualty reports in disbelief. Thousands of ships lost, tens of thousands of soldiers dead or captured. And the humans? They had suffered losses, yes, but nothing like what had been predicted. I don't understand, Coot said, turning to Captain Vex Lore. How are they doing this? How can they sustain such casualties and keep fighting? Vex Lore's eyes were dark with a mixture of fear and grudging respect. Because, Officer Coots, we fundamentally misunderstood our enemy. We thought their short lifespans would make them fear death, make them easy to cow into submission. He gestured at the screen showing the human fleet regrouping, seemingly undaunted by their losses. We were wrong. They don't fear death. They embrace it, if it means achieving their goals. As the righteous fury jumped to light speed, retreating to friendly space for repairs, Coots felt the first stirrings of doubt. The humans should have broken under the might of the Galactic Council. Instead, they stood firm, pushing back with a ferocity that bordered on madness. Six months into the war, Coots found himself on the muddy surface of Epsilon Eridani I.I., pinned down by relentless human fire. What should have been a routine operation to secure a strategic outpost had turned into a nightmare. Watch the tree line, Coots shouted to his squad, his voice barely audible over the cacophony of battle. They're using those those earth beasts again. As if on cue, a pack of large, furry creatures burst from the forest's edge. Coots had learned to recognize them as bears, but nothing in his training had prepared him for the sight of these animals charging into battle alongside human soldiers. Energy weapons on full spread, he ordered, desperately trying to stem the tide of teeth and claws bearing down on them. The air crackled with plasma discharge, but for every bear that fell, two more seemed to take its place. And then came the dogs. Smaller than the bears, but no less ferocious, they darted between the plasma bolts with uncanny agility. Coots watched in horror as one of his soldiers went down under a snarling mass of fur and fangs. Fall back, he yelled, realizing the position was lost. Retreat to secondary defenses. As they ran, something small and agile dropped onto Coots' back from an overhanging branch. He flailed, trying to dislodge it, only to find himself staring into the clever eyes of a raccoon its tiny hands already working to disable his armor's power systems. By the time Coots managed to shake off the creature, his squad had been reduced to half its original size. They limped back to the command post, shell-shocked and demoralized. I don't understand, one of his soldiers said, voice trembling. How can they control these animals? Why do the beasts fight alongside them so willingly? Coots had no answer. The humans' ability to turn the indigenous life of their planet into willing soldiers defied explanation. It was as if every living thing on Earth had united against the Galactic Council. Later, as Coots delivered his report to High Command, he could see the disbelief and frustration etched on every alien face. First their unexplained technological leap, and now this General Tsar Kax growled. Using animals as weapons? It's... it's barbaric. With all due respect, General Coots said, surprising himself with his boldness, it's effective. We're losing ground on every front. The humans are adapting faster than we can counter them. The General's eyes narrowed. Are you suggesting we cannot win this war, Officer Coots? Coots straightened his posture. No, sir. I'm suggesting that if we don't start adapting ourselves, we won't survive it. As he left the command center, Coots couldn't shake the image of those earth animals fighting with such coordinated ferocity. The humans had taken beings that should have been no more than simple beasts and turned them into formidable warriors. Two years into the war, Coots stood on the bridge of the battlecruiser, unyielding resolve, staring at the holographic display of the Proxima Centauri system. The conflict had evolved in ways none in the Galactic Council could have predicted, and humanity's latest innovation was about to make itself known. Sir, we're detecting multiple signatures emerging from hyperspace, the sensor officer reported, her voice tight with tension. Coots leaned forward, his four eyes narrowing as the readings flashed across the screen. Configuration. Unknown, sir. 
There, they're not matching any known human vessel designs. The main view screen flickered to life, and Coots felt his blood run cold. The ships emerging from hyperspace were like nothing he'd ever seen. Sleek, angular, and devoid of any life signs, they moved with a precision that seemed almost impossible. By the void, Captain Lax era whispered, they're unmanned, completely automated. Before Coots could respond, the robotic fleet opened fire. Energy beams lanced out, cutting through the Council's defensive line with terrifying accuracy. Ships that had weathered countless battles against human fleets crumbled under the onslaught. Evasive maneuvers Coots shouted, taking command as the captain stood frozen in shock. All ships concentrate fire on the lead vessel. But it was like fighting shadows. The robotic ships moved in perfect synchronization, anticipating every tactic, countering every strategy. For every drone they managed to destroy, three more seemed to take its place. As the battle raged, Coots realized with growing horror that this was more than just a new weapon. It was a paradigm shift. The humans had overcome the last limitation holding them back the need for living pilots. Hours later, as the unyielding resolve limped away from the devastated system, Coots found himself in an emergency council with the remaining ship captains. How one of them demanded, her holographic image flickering. How have they achieved this level of artificial intelligence? It should be centuries beyond their capabilities. Coot shook his head, his mind racing. We've underestimated them at every turn. Their drive to survive, to win at all costs. It's pushed them to achieve the impossible. But at what cost another captain interjected? The resource drained to create such a fleet must be enormous. Surely they can't sustain this. But even as the words were spoken, reports flooded in from across the front lines. The robot fleets weren't an isolated incident. They were everywhere, turning the tide of battle after battle. Later, alone in his quarters, Coots reviewed the footage from the battle. He watched the seamless coordination of the robotic ships, their inhuman precision and fearlessness. The humans had taken their greatest weakness, their fragile, short-lived bodies, and turned it into their greatest strength. No longer bound by the limitations of flesh and blood, the humans could wage war with a ferocity and persistence that no organic being could match. They had created tireless, fearless soldiers that could learn and adapt at speeds that defied comprehension. As he stared at the image of a robotic fighter effortlessly evading council fire, Coots felt a chill run down his spine. The humans hadn't just developed a new weapon. They had evolved beyond the very constraints of their species. And Coots realized, with a sinking feeling in his gut, that the Galactic Council might have finally met an enemy it couldn't defeat. Five years into the war, Coots stood before the remnants of the Galactic Council, his posture rigid but his spirit weary. The Grand Chamber, once filled with representatives from a thousand worlds, now echoed with emptiness. Only a handful of species remained committed to the fight against humanity. And, with the withdrawal of the Zin Thari Collective, our effective fighting force has been reduced by another 15% Coots concluded his report, his voice heavy with the weight of impending doom. I, Counselor Nathi, looking far older than when the war began, leaned forward. How many does that make now, Officer Coots? 712 species have either formally withdrawn from the Alliance or have been. Pacified by the humans, High Counselor Coots replied, struggling to keep the bitterness from his voice. A murmur of dismay rippled through the chamber. What had begun as a united front against human expansion had crumbled into a desperate struggle for survival. And what of the Kilari? Surely they still stand with us, asked another counselor, his holographic form flickering with interference a common sight now that the humans controlled so many communication relays. Coots hesitated before responding. The Kilari homeworld fell three cycles ago, Counselor. Their remaining forces have gone into hiding. We believe they're attempting to negotiate a separate peace with the humans. The news hit like a physical blow. The Kulari had been among their strongest allies, their vast fleets a backbone of the Council's military might. With their loss, the balance of power had shifted decisively. How Nethi whispered, more to himself than to the Assembly. How has it come to this? We outnumbered them a million to one. We had the combined knowledge of galactic civilizations spanning billions of years. 
They were confined to a single world mere centuries ago. Coote stepped forward, compelled to speak. High Counselor, esteemed members of the Council, I have faced the humans on a hundred battlefields. I have seen them fight with machines, beasts, and their own bodies. But their most powerful weapon isn't something we can shoot down or outmaneuver. He paused, gathering his thoughts. It's their refusal to accept defeat. Their ability to look at impossibility as a challenge rather than a limit. We thought their short lifespans would make them easy to outlast, but it only drove them to accomplish in years what takes us centuries. Silence fell over the chamber as the weight of Coot's words sank in. It was Nithi who finally broke it. Then what hope do we have? If we cannot match their drive, their innovation, their, their sheer stubbornness, how can we hope to win this war? Coot stood straighter, his four eyes blazing with a determination he hadn't felt in years. We adapt. We learn. We do what the humans have done from the start. We refuse to accept that defeat is inevitable. As the council debated long into the night, Coots found himself staring out at the stars. Somewhere out there, the human fleets advanced, their robotic armies conquering world after world. The few species still fighting alongside Coots' people were being pushed back on all fronts. Yet, as he watched a distant star flare and die likely another battleground, lost Coots felt a strange mix of fear and admiration. The humans had rewritten the rules of warfare, of technological advancement, of what was thought possible. They had entered this war as an upstart species, denied their place among the stars. Now, they were poised to become the dominant force in the galaxy. As Coots turned back to rejoin the Council, he couldn't help but wonder in their relentless quest to defeat humanity, had they inadvertently created the very thing they feared most an unstoppable galactic power. The war was far from over, but for the first time, Coots began to consider a future where victory might not mean the defeat of humanity, but finding a way to coexist with this terrifyingly tenacious species. Seven years into a war that should have lasted mere hours, Coots found himself aboard the supercarrier Eternal Vigilance, the last great hope of the remaining Council forces. The massive ship, nearly the size of a small moon, represented the pinnacle of their combined technological might. It was a testament to how far they'd come in their desperate arms race against humanity and how far they still had to go. All hands, battle stations Admiral Vexlor's voice echoed through the ship's comm systems, human fleet detected entering the Andromeda 7 system. Coots rushed to his post on the bridge, his four eyes quickly scanning the tactical displays. The human armada filled the screens a mix of their impossibly advanced robotic ships and vessels piloted by flesh and blood crews. At the center of their formation loomed a ship that rivaled the eternal vigilance in size. By the void someone whispered, Is that? Admiral Vex Lore nodded grimly. The Terran Will, humanity's own supercarrier. A hush fell over the bridge. They'd all heard rumors of this ship, whispered tales of its devastating power. To see it here, now, was to know that humanity had committed fully to this final battle. All fighter squadrons, launch Vexlor commanded. Defensive screens to maximum. Prepare main cannon for firing. Coots watched as swarms of their fighters poured from the Eternal Vigilance's launch bays. It was an impressive sight, thousands of craft forming up into perfect attack formations. For a moment, hope swelled in his chest. Then the humans launched their counterattack. Sleek, arrow-shaped fighters screamed out from the Terran will, moving with a speed and agility that defied physics. Interspersed among them were swarms of smaller craft drones, Coots realized with a sinking feeling. Each no larger than a human himself, but moving with terrifying coordination. The battle was joined, space lighting up with weapons fire. Coots coordinated the point defense systems, trying desperately to track the human craft. But for every drone they destroyed, three more seemed to take its place. The human fighters danced between energy beams, retaliating with weapons that cut through shields like they weren't even there. 30% of our fighter screen is down, a tactical officer reported, her voice strained. We're barely scratching their drones and their piloted craft. Sir, I've never seen flying like this. It's like they've merged with their ships. Coots had heard rumors of this two neural interfaces that allowed human pilots to control their craft as extensions of their own bodies. He dismissed it as propaganda. Now, watching the impossible maneuvers on the tactical screen, he knew the truth. 
A massive tremor rocked the eternal vigilance. Direct hit to our port side, someone shouted. Shield generators 12 through 18 are offline. Admiral Vexlor's face was grim. Return fire. All batteries concentrate on the Terran will. The supercarrier's main cannon fired, a beam of pure energy lancing out towards the human flagship. For a heartbeat, Kutz allowed himself to hope. Then the impossible happened. The beam struck some kind of energy field around the Terran will and split, fragments of the blast scattering harmlessly into space. No effect the weapons officer reported, disbelief evident in his voice. Their shields. Sir, we barely scratched them. As Coots watched the tactical displays in growing horror, he saw their fighter screen crumble. The few remaining council ships in their fleet were being picked apart by human drones and fighters. And all the while, the Terran will advance, unstoppable as death itself. Admiral Coots said, his voice barely a whisper, what do we do? For the first time in all the years Coots had served under him, Admiral Vexlor looked uncertain. We've never retreated, he said, not once in 10,000 years of keeping the peace. But now, another blast rocked the ship. Warning klaxons blared as system after system reported critical failures. Prepare for emergency jump Vexlor finally ordered. We need to save what we can, regroup, find a way to. His words were cut off as the bridge erupted in chaos. Coots was thrown to the ground, ears ringing from the explosion. As he struggled to his feet, he saw figures pouring through a breach in the hull humanoid shapes encased in sleek, powered armor. The humans had boarded them. As Coots drew his sidearm, knowing it to be futile, he couldn't help but marvel at the sheer audacity. Even in the face of certain victory, the humans chose the most difficult path boarding a supercarrier mid-battle. They truly didn't know how to quit. The last thing Coots saw before a stun blast took him down was a human marine, armor scorched and dented, advancing implacably forward. In that moment, Coots knew that the war was truly finally lost. Humanity hadn't just beaten them. They had outfought, outthought, and outevolved them at every turn. Coots regained consciousness to a world of chaos. The pristine bridge of the eternal vigilance had been transformed into a war zone. Sparks rained from shattered consoles, and the air was thick with smoke and the acrid smell of weapons fire. As he struggled to his feet, Coots saw Admiral Vexlor organizing a desperate defense. The few remaining bridge crew had taken up positions behind overturned stations, their weapons trained on the sealed bulkhead doors. Officer Coots Vexlor shouted, tossing him a pulse rifle. Glad to see you're still with us. We've got borders on multiple decks. Security teams are engaged, but they're being overwhelmed. Coots checked the rifle's charge. Sir, with respect, why haven't they just destroyed us? They clearly have the firepower. Vexlor's expression was grim. Because that's not how they operate, is it? They don't just want to win. They want to understand, to learn to, evolve. Before Coots could respond, the bulkhead doors exploded inward. Through the smoke and debris strode figures that seemed more machine than organic humans encased in powered armor, unlike anything Coots had ever seen. Open fire Vexlor roared. Energy beams lanced out, striking the armored humans dead center. Coots felt a moment of triumph only to watch in horror as the beams dissipated harmlessly against shimmering energy shields. Impossible Coots breathed. Our weapons? They're ineffective. The humans advanced methodically, their own weapons spitting out darts of blue energy that bypassed shields and armor alike. Coots watched helplessly as his comrades fell, their bodies seizing up as if struck by a powerful nerve agent. In desperation, Coots charged the nearest human, attempting to use his superior size and strength to grapple the armored figure. It was like hitting a wall. The human pivoted, moving with impossible speed and grace, and Coots found himself airborne, then slammed hard against a bulkhead. As he slid to the ground, dazed, Coots got his first clear look at the human's armor. It was a masterpiece of engineering sleek, articulated, and humming with barely contained power. Glowing lines traced its surface, pulsing in time with the human's movements. A neural interface Coots realized aloud. The armor. It's an extension of their bodies. 
The human turned to face him, the featureless faceplate regarding him impassively. When it spoke, the voice was distorted but unmistakably filled with pride. Correct, alien. Quantum entangled neural links, allowing for reaction times you can't even comprehend. Coupled with our exo enhancile frame, it makes us stronger, faster, and more resilient than any organic being. Coot struggled to stand, leaning against the bulkhead for support. Around him, the last pockets of resistance were being systematically neutralized. Admiral Vex Lore lay unconscious nearby, his final stand cut short by the human's overwhelming technological superiority. Why, Coots asked, his voice thick with emotion. Why go to such lengths? You've already won. The galaxy is yours for the taking. The human was silent for a moment, then reached up and removed its helmet. Coots found himself staring into the eyes of a young female, her expression a mix of determination and... Was that sadness? Because we had to, she said softly. Because you tried to cage us, to deny us the stars. We fought not just for victory, but for the right to exist as we choose. Every advancement, every innovation they were born from the fear that if we faltered even for a moment, we'd lose everything. As more humans entered the bridge, securing prisoners and accessing the ship's systems, Coots felt the last of his resistance crumble. They had created soldiers that were practically invincible, had developed technologies that bordered on magic, all in the span of a few short years. It's over, Coots said, more to himself than to his captors. We never stood a chance, did we? The human soldier regarded him with an unreadable expression. The war is over, she agreed. But for humanity, our journey is just beginning. The question is, alien, are you ready to begin yours? As Coots was led away, he caught a glimpse of the starfield outside the shattered bridge viewport. The human fleet hung there, victorious and unopposed, and beyond them, the infinite expanse of the galaxy, a galaxy that would never be the same again. The age of the Galactic Council had ended. The age of humanity had begun. The holding cell aboard the human ship Terran Will was unlike any prison Coots had ever seen. It was spacious, well-lit, and even equipped with amenities suited to his species' physiology. This final act of consideration from his captors was almost more than he could bear. Coots sat on the edge of his bed, all four of his eyes fixed on the energy field that served as the cell's door. Beyond it, he could see humans bustling about some in the miraculous powered armor, others in what he assumed were standard uniforms. Their efficiency and purpose were palpable. A human approached his cell, the same female soldier who had removed her helmet on the bridge of the Eternal Vigilance. She deactivated the energy field and stepped inside. Officer Coots, she said, her tone respectful. I'm Commander Martha Briggs. I hope you've been treated well. Coots nodded slowly. Better than I expected. Better than we treated human prisoners, I'm ashamed to admit. Martha's expression softened. The war is over, Coots. We're not here to perpetuate cycles of vengeance or cruelty. We're here to build a new future one that includes all sentient species. How can you be so? Magnanimous Coots asked, genuine confusion in his voice. After all we did to try to contain you, to destroy you. Martha sat down opposite him. Because that drive to overcome, to innovate, to push beyond our limits, it wasn't born from a desire for conquest. It came from a deep-seated need to explore, to understand, to grow. Yes, you forced our hand, but in doing so, you unleashed potential we never knew we had. Coots absorbed her words, thinking back on the incredible advancements he'd witnessed. Your robots, your bioengineered animals, your powered armor. In seven years, you achieved what took other races millennia. Martha nodded. Necessity is the mother of invention, as an old human saying goes. But now that the necessity of war is behind us, imagine what we could achieve in peace. Imagine what all our species could achieve together. As if on cue, the wall of the cell became transparent, revealing the vast starfield outside. Coots gasped as he realized they were in orbit around Earth humanity's homeworld. It was beautiful, a blue and green jewel suspended in the void. This is why we fought so hard, Martha said softly. Not just for ourselves, but for the promise of what's out there. The wonders we've yet to discover, the mysteries we've yet to unravel. Coots felt something shift within him. The fear and resentment that had driven him for seven long years began to fade, replaced by a tentative hope. 
What happens now, he asked. Martha stood, offering him her hand. Now we rebuild. We restructure the galactic community not as conquerors, but as partners. Your knowledge, your history, your unique perspectives, they're invaluable. We want to learn from you, even as we share what we've learned. Coots hesitated for a moment, then took her hand, allowing her to help him up. As he did, he saw not an enemy, but a potential ally. A member of a species that had gone from confined to a single world to masters of the galaxy in less than a decade. You know, Coots said, a hint of humor in his voice for the first time in years, when this war started, I never imagined it would end with me feeling hopeful about the future. Martha laughed a warm, genuine sound. That's the thing about us humans, Coots. We don't just refuse to quit. We refuse to give up on the possibility of a better tomorrow, no matter the odds. As they walked out of the cell together, Coots looked once more at the earth hanging in space. He thought about everything that had led to this moment, the battles, the innovations, the sheer, relentless determination of humanity. Yes, their refusal to quit had cost his people the war. But perhaps, Coots reflected, it had also given the galaxy something far more valuable, a future filled with limitless potential. And for the first time since the war began, Coots found himself looking forward to what that future might bring. Thank you so much for listening to this story. I hope you loved it. Please remember to subscribe if you did like it so you can see more videos like this. And please give us a like and a comment too. I'll see you in the next one.